Hi everyone, you are listening to She Leads with Carly, and I've got another exciting new episode for you guys today with our guest, Shelly Brunswick. Shelly is the Chief Operating Officer at Space Foundation and has an amazing journey that began in the U.S. Air Force right out of high school to eventually entering into the space industry, a path that she never anticipated entering. One of my favorite takeaways from Shelly is the idea of finding your mentor, your coach, and then your champion, the ones who help you rise to the next level in your career. This and so much more from Shelly. Enjoy this one. Hello, Shelly. Thank you so much for coming on to She Leads today. I'm so excited to talk to you. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. How are you doing? I'm doing well. So where are you calling from today? Where in the world are you? That's a great question. Well, fortunately, due to telecommunications and space technology, I am calling you from Colorado Springs, Colorado. Incredible. So we'll hear more about space technology from you, which I'm excited about. But first, Shelly, you are the Chief Operating Officer of the Space Foundation, and you're also the Executive Leader of the Center of Innovation and Education. Prior to this, you were a Space Acquisition and Program Management Leader and Congressional Liaison for the U.S. Air Force, and as a leading role, role model for women in space, you were selected as the Woman Tech Network Diversity and Inclusion Officer and Mentor of last year in 2020. And to top it all off, out of one of only 35 women, in, you were selected to be the, by the United Nations as a mentor for the Space for Women program and your World Business Angels Investment Forum Senator for the USA. So, Shelly, I am just honestly so excited to talk to you, not only as an incredible female leader, but also a leader in space. And that's just incredible in itself. So I'm excited to talk to you. And what I like to do, how I like to get started is, you know, take me back to usually college, but for you, I wanna go even before, to high school. You decided to enlist in the military, not a traditional, not a conventional decision. Usually you go to college. I wanna hear about this decision. What made you decide? Did you have you know, family members who joined the military as well? So tell me about that decision. Well, thank you for inviting me to join you today. I'm honored to be here and I'm happy to share my story and hopefully it will help inspire others to follow their track and their journey. Uh, as you said, I did join the military right out of high school. And while I was in high school, I participated in sports and I liked art and I, I enjoyed other outside activities, theater and other things. But when I graduated high school, you know, I wasn't necessarily ready to jump right into going to college. I didn't know what I wanted to do, what I wanted to major in. And for me, the military was a great option to explore and learn more about myself. My dad had been in the U.S. Air Force. So I enlisted in the U.S. Air Force and I had a wonderful opportunity learning more about myself and what I wanted to be when I grow up. And I'm still working on that today, what I want to be when I grow up. So I'm not sure we ever we ever cross the finish line. Yeah. So tell me about that that transitional period, because, you know, it's not an easy period, even going into college. But here you are going into the military. I believe you went straight to Europe. Is that right? Or did you stay in America? Correct. So I always like to say I have three chapters in my story right now, my journey. And that first chapter is enlisting in the U.S. Air Force. And I was a personnel specialist. And I had the privilege of being okay. stationed in both Turkey and Germany and then here in Colorado Springs at the U.S. Air Force Academy. And during that time, wow. I got to serve my country during the day, which was wonderful. Learn, learn a skill, meet other people, network. And then at night, I actually did start my college program and complete going to the uh, my under my bachelor's and my master's degree going to school at night. So during the day I worked at night, I went to school. And when I completed my bachelor's degree, I did apply to become an officer in the U.S. Air Force. And that kind of closed that first chapter of my story and started the next chapter of my story, which is the story you probably most know me for, which is what started my career in the aerospace and space industry. Wow. Okay. So before we even get to space, I think it's incredible. The fact that you're in the military, also doing school at night, you know, I can imagine there were challenges. How was that time? Was it challenging? Also, you know, are there many females? Were there many females in the military at that time? You know, did you kind of go through this imposter syndrome, maybe feeling that you didn't belong? 
Well, that is a great question. The first part of my journey as an enlisted uh, personnel specialist, there were many women. Um, so I was able to network with a lot of other women, but I also, I was an only child. So for me, I okay. really didn't notice a difference between whether people were men or women. I mean, people are just people. And so for me, it was a different experience, right. especially when I became an officer and I was in the space career field. I, there were many times I was the only woman in a meeting. I, re, I never really noticed it, but other people would notice it and come up and say, how does it feel being the only woman in the meeting? And, you know, you kind of look around and you're like, oh, I didn't notice it. So, so for me, I didn't yeah. notice those perceptions or issues. And I, I just move forward with life and did the best I could do. And, uh, and, and it works out. So there are challenges. I mean, it's never fun to work during the day and go to school at night, but that's no different than many other people in the world today who are going, who are working and going to school or balancing a family. So all I highlight is we all have challenges. Our schedules are all full, but there are ways to accomplish yeah. higher goals. So if you want to go to school, especially nowadays, you can do it online. You know, I had to go in school in person, you know, because that was back in the day. But you can go to school online yeah. and there are many other ways to pursue higher education. So don't let having a family or a job or any of those things stand in your way of accomplishing your goals. Set that goal out there and and work towards it. Yeah, amazing. And so when you were getting your degree at this point, did you have this passion for space or what, you know, at this point, what did you imagine your career after the military, after becoming an officer? So I really did not expect my career to go into the space sector. You know, again, that was not the normal trajectory for most people back in yeah. that, in those days, that was the 1980s. So I want to kind of share with everybody what has happened in the space sector. We all think today about Elon Musk and space is very popular, but back in the 1980s, you have to remember, we were out of the Apollo era, we were into the shuttle era, and so you either had to work at NASA or you had to be in certain defense contractors or certain areas of the U.S. military to participate in space. It wasn't a mainstream activity. But since the 1980s to today, there's been the right legislation that has allowed for commercial commercialization of space like we see with Elon Musk and his recent announcement of commercial passengers riding in the Dragon. Right. But we also see the commercialization of taking technology that we've learned from space and creating companies and businesses and bringing that to market. So over that course of yeah. that 30 to 40 years, space has changed. So no, space was not really a possibility for me at the time. I did not anticipate that would have been my career trajectory. But when I became an officer in the U.S. Air Force, I became a space program management um, officer, and I was stationed at the Space and Missile Systems Center, and that really started my career in the space and aerospace industry, where I worked on, you know, launch vehicles and ground segments and on-orbit platforms, and I learned about the space industry enough that I then became a professor at Defense Acquisition University and taught about space and the space life cycle and project management, and then ultimately culminated my U.S. Air Force career working on Capitol Hill as a budget and appropriation liaison, articulating to members of Congress the U.S. Air Force needs for the programs and funding of what the Air Force does mission-wise. So it was a great career, and again, it was not something I had planned. So many times when people when you're going to college or you're wondering what your career is going to be, you don't necessarily know what the future is. None of us have the magic eight ball. But what you can do is what I did or what many people do. You can prepare yourself, take classes, network, mentor, do webinars, so that when that opportunity presents itself, you can latch on to it and who knows what the next ride will be. And I was able to latch on to space in the aerospace sector. And it's been a wonderful uh, career. I love what I do. I think space is going to be the largest economy in the world in the next 10 to 20 years. And I want everyone to be able to find their place in the space sector. Wow, incredible. So even at that time in the 80s, as you said, it wasn't a popular industry. It wasn't easy to enter it. You know, were people saying to you, like, Shelly, no, maybe go down this more traditional route instead of space or, you know, or did you have mentors on the other hand saying, 
yeah, go for it. There's a lot of innovations, a lot of excitement, a lot of opportunities. Um, so what were you kind of hearing and how did you really navigate to go and take that dive into the industry? So that's great. I, I did not have a choice. <laughs> so that made it okay. good for me. Okay. The Air Force made my choice for me. When I became an officer, I, I, I was looking at more traditional roles like public affairs or protocol or HR. However, the Air Force had yeah. a need for people to become project managers in the space industry. So they made the choice for me. So sometimes it's, it's just luck. And then the other part yeah. was, as I progressed in my career, I did have wonderful mentors. And I like to highlight there's three different people. There's mentors, there's coaches, and there's champions. And I was fortunate to have all of those. Mentors help you understand the basic skills and give you input so that you can incorporate it. Coaches is just like when you're on a team. They help coach you to get your skill set and level up to a higher performing level. And then champions are usually individuals that are higher in higher positions than you that help you rise to the next level in your career. So I was fortunate to have all three of those. And I recommend to anybody who is entering any career field to look for those mentors, coaches, and champions to help you as you progress through your career. I love it. I love that. I've never heard that phrase. I've kind of just put them in a bucket of mentors. So I, I like that a lot. And so keeping on this line, you know, what advice do you have for actually seeking out those mentors, coaches, and champions? Because, you know, it's, it's easy to say, just go find them. But like, what are some tangible steps that people can take? You know, they have this passion, they're interested in this industry. How can we find those people who are willing to help and who are invested in us? So I think that's a great question. And the first place you can start is where are you at the moment? Um, you know, the world has become flatter due to technology. And so we're able to reach out to people. So where before, like when I was rising in my career, you really had to know somebody in your local area or they had to know somebody you could call on the phone, which none of us have anymore, right? We all have, we all have iPhones and, you know, Androids. But today you're able to reach out through technology and there are so many programs available, whether it's Women in Aerospace, Space Generation Advisory Council, Women Tech Network, as you mentioned, the UN Space for Women program. So no matter where you right. are regionally, you can find a mentor who can help you. And the great thing about mentorship is it opens up so many other opportunities. So what I like to share is, for at the Space Foundation, our Center for Innovation and Education, we have a five-step workforce development roadmap. And it's access, mm -hmm. awareness, training, connecting, and mentoring. Well, mentoring, finding a mentor can usually unlock those other four areas. A mentor can provide awareness of opportunities you may have not known existed before, career opportunities. A mentor can help provide access into that career opportunity whether you know motivating you to go to college or meet with recruiters or look at NASA websites or uh, many other things. Training, obviously a mentor can guide you in the right direction for the training you need for the future you want. And lastly, it's about building that network and connecting because as we rise, yeah. like I said, you're gonna look for mentors, coaches and um, advisors along the way, but you know what else? you're gonna become a mentor and a coach and an advisor and a champion for somebody else. So always remember, find a mentor and you can be a mentor. Yeah, I love it. I love it, I think it's so great. So now going back to your story, take me to where you are today. Take me to that third chapter that you are in now. Tell me about the Space Foundation and your role as the COO. So when I retired from the Air Force, I was fortunate that the Space Foundation was looking for a new chief operating officer, and I've now been here six years. It, it has passed in the blink of an eye because I just love what I do. I love the team I work with, and ultimately, I love what we talk about, which is really about creating space opportunities for all, breaking down barriers, and allowing everyone to find their place in the space industry whether they're, it's a STEM degree or non-STEM, entrepreneurial, business background, artist, there is a place for everyone now in the space ecosystem. And that's what's really exciting about sharing that message with others, how they can find their place in space. I love it. So 
before you know you saw this open position for operating officer did you have experience in an operational role was that something that you know were you just excited about were you maybe scared or how was that transition into that role that's a really great question because initially i do what many people think i disqualified myself from the position of chief operating officer um, I was retiring off Capitol Hill, and so most people that were like me with my skill set of program management and Capitol Hill experience become government relations. So they go work at a company or they become, they go work in a, a, a government relations um, organization. However, when this okay. position opened up and somebody sent it to me, you know, I looked at the requirements. And I met many of them. You know, I had done many of those roles, leadership roles, facilities, operational management, program management. I had done those things in the Air Force. So uh, another mentor of mine said, you should apply. Don't ever disqualify yourself from a position you haven't been offered. So I applied, I was mm. fortunate to be interviewed and I made it to the final four. And when I walked out that day, that day from that final interview, the CEO shook my hand and told me, welcome to the team. Wow, amazing. And I think you touch on like a very important aspect. And I've talked about this in other of my other episodes, but the idea where, you know, I think women, females, they go into reading job descriptions and maybe they don't have, you know, one of the qualifications and then they immediately disqualify themselves. And so, and you know, there's been studies about it where versus men, they have maybe two or three and they're like, okay, great, this is, this is my job. So I think you just touch on that importance of having that confidence, knowing that, okay, yes, maybe you don't fit all of them to a T, but still going there, showing, showing them who you are, what you're capable of. And then from there, you know, like you said, like you, you end up getting the role. So I think that's, I think that's awesome. And how has that been, you know, what what would you say are the three key skills that you think any successful COO need to have? Well, that is an excellent question, and there are a number of great skills. Obviously, the first one yeah. is to be a compassionate leader. We need to listen to our employees. We need to empathize with our employees, and we need to help grow our employees because the employees are the individuals that make it all happen. So we have to be yeah. um, compassionate leaders. We have to communicate both with our team internally, but also externally. Um, everybody on the team needs to know the message. It shouldn't be a surprise to them what I'm saying outside the Space Foundation or any organization. So it's good to everybody understands good communication skills. And then again, the other part is being a f reflective leader, processing what's happened, Ooh. how can you learn from it, and then set the next trajectory. So we always set you always create plans, you know, your baseline, but life has a, ch a way of changing that baseline. COVID happens. So how do you flex? How do you flex yourself, your leadership style, and how do you help flex your team? And, the, and COVID is just the next thing, but there'll be no something else and there'll be something else. So I'd almost say that's building resiliency in yourself because there are no constants. Everything is changing, whether it's competition, COVID, um, technology, we need to con continually be prepared to flex and change that baseline so we can be responsive and continue to be leaders. Yeah, I love it. I think that's so excellent. And so Shelly, I love asking my guests, you know, what is, what does failure mean to you? And like when you experience failure or a setback, like how do you respond to that? And I've learned it's, it's largely a mentality, but I want to know kind of looking back at your career, maybe you've experienced challenges. How was that? How, how was that period and how did you respond to it? Well, I think everyone needs to understand, first of all, all careers have ups and downs, right? No career is okay. straight up. So we have to remember that as we're transit zigging and zagging through our career, there are going to be higher points and lower points and that's okay. That's normal. Don't get down on yourself. The best thing to do is look at failure as a learning opportunity, right? Um, you know, Thomas yeah. Edison, how many times did it take him to get the light bulb right? SpaceX, you know, you can look at all, all kinds of cutting edge technology breakthroughs and leaders who made it happen. The ultimate thing is to step back and self-reflect. What could I have done better? What could I have done differently? How can I improve? So make it a learning opportunity mm -hmm. and then do it again. 
right? Be resilient. Don't let that first setback set you back. I mean, the first yeah. time you're an A student, but you got to see, okay, let it go. You know what? Get a B the next time, get an A the next time. Um, we're yeah. not all perfect. So we're going to learn and that's okay. Life is lifelong learning, whether it's in college or it's learning, learning on the job. Just, just yeah. be open-minded, be reflective and be resilient. You will overcome this. You will learn from this and you know what? You'll be ready for the next challenge and you will succeed. I love it. I love it. So great. And so Shelly, I know you're heavily involved in really getting minority groups and, you know, specifically young females into the space industry, whether it's being a mentor for space for women and whatnot. So tell me, how has that been? And what's been this, what's a big barrier to getting those minorities into the space industry? Well, I think that's an excellent way of looking at it. I think the first question is, you know, it's really about that workforce development roadmap I shared. It's about awareness. Most individuals, whether they're minorities or women or underserved groups. So in the U.S., I would say underrepresented groups could be inner city or rural, rural communities. So again, yeah. who may not be normally represented in that aerospace or space industry? The first step is it's about awareness that we now, because of the commercialization of space, have the opportunities for all individuals to find their place. Here in the U.S., 80% um, of our space economy is commercial. 20% is government. Mm -hmm. So when you think about that, that means not only do I need engineers and scientists, but I need business administrators and technical experts, um, you know, trade skills. I need um, business experts. I need entrepreneurs. I may need artists and right. marketing executives. So the, the first thing that you have to look at is breaking down the barrier that space is not inclusive. It is inclusive, okay. but there's still that perception that space is about astronauts and launch vehicles, which is totally a great part of the space sector, but it's a small fraction of the space ecosystem. Uh, what I like to highlight is the current global space economy is $424 billion. And that is going to grow one to $3 trillion in the next 10 to 20 years. Bank of America wow. is predicting that the global space economy will be $1.3 trillion by 2030. And again, that is democratizing space, not just in the US, but globally. So all countries and regions can determine how do they wanna participate in the space economy? Do they wanna be entrepreneurial and bring products to market? Or do they wanna use space technology to better life on earth? For instance, earth observation. In Africa, you know, last year, uh, many countries in Af Africa used earth observation for locust control, animal migration, um, the COVID virus, telehealth. Wow. So I share with you, not every country has to use space technology the way the U.S. does. The, they can look at how the U.S. uses space technology or Russia or China or others, and then they can determine what is the path that's best for their country and community and workforce. Wow, amazing. And so Shelly, honestly, I can keep talking to you for hours about this because it is fascinating. But you mentioned early on that, you know, you're always growing and you, you know, you're still, you still think of your career as, you know, what's next. So I'm, I'm interested to know, what do you imagine? How do you plan out your future and your career in terms of next steps? How do you think of that? Well, that's an excellent question. And what I share with people is just always be prepared, be a lifelong learner. I am always learning yeah. and growing. I'm taking webinars. I, I loved watching your show. I watch other shows. So being a lifelong learner can mean going to college, but that's just one path. Another path is there are so many things that you can learn from television. Um, I love a couple of shows. For those of you who want to be entrepreneurs, one of the first things I always recommend is, are you watching Shark Tank? And in, in the UK, they call it Dragon's Lair. That's, that's where entrepreneurs really? have to pitch their idea to investors. I mean, it's a great way of learning. I want to be an entrepreneur. What are the questions I'm going to have to answer? Um, I love watching other shows on CNBC, like with Jim Cramer, Mad Money, because he interviews um, 
executives and leaders in cutting edge technology because I can learn about the technology that's coming online, the internet of things, 5G, um, FinTech. Yeah. And those are also part of the space industry. Those are all part of intertwined with space. So it helps me think about what's coming, what are the trends, what are the future industries, how is space, my background, going to intersect with that? And how do I stay sharp and stay on top of cutting edge in my career field? And how can I share that? Because one of my passions is mentorship. How do I share that with others so they can find their pathway in this emerging ecosystem that we call the space economy. Incredible. I love it. And another, I'll add to that list. Another one of my favorite podcasts is How I Built This with Guy Raz, a very well-known one. He interviews incredible founders and entrepreneurs. So I would add that to the list. So Shelly, now for some fun questions. I want to know first, what's a passion that you have that's just completely unrelated to any any of your work? What's a hobby of yours? Excellent. Well, I love to travel, obviously, having joined the Air Force right out of high school and wanting to see the world. Um, I love to travel. I love to meet people. I look forward to meeting with you in Israel or San Francisco or wherever you might be post-COVID. Yes. So travel has always been a passion along with photography. Um, but right now, obviously, with COVID, I'm, my, my, my trips are more local. They're hiking here in the beautiful Colorado Rocky Mountains or going to our beautiful Cheyenne Mountain Zoo and taking photos of animals and nature and wildlife. So that's one of my passions because people think about space as outer space, but you know, it's also about how space benefits us here on earth. So when I get to look at beautiful nature and animals and wildlife, space intersects those passions as well. I love it. That's awesome. And my last question. So Shelly, what is a fun or weird talent that you have that no one really knows about. So it's like a weird hidden talent. So I'm gonna go first. So what I do is I like to throw blueberries into my mouth. So I've been doing this since the first episode and I'm gonna do it for you right now. So here's a blueberry. All right, let's see how this goes. Oh, there we go. <laughs> awesome, awesome. I don't quite have Thank that you. talent skill. So this will be something that will be new to anybody who follows me or my coworkers. Uh, pri I used to live in LA and uh, while I was in LA, one of the things I loved to do was dance. So I would take many dance classes. I would also dance in many theater groups and musicals. And so dance is one of my hidden passions, Polynesian dancing, uh, belly dancing, hip hop dancing. I haven't done it in a while, wow. but again, I anticipate that at some point in my in my life, in my journey, I will find an opportunity to go back to dancing. I also found it wonderful. I made some amazing friends when I was in those dance troops. And so I, I look at it, it was both fun, it was exercise, and I got to meet wonderful people. Wow, Shelly, I love that. Well, it's just been so much fun. Really, thank you for coming on the show. I've loved learning about your journey, starting in the military, in the Air Force, to now being the COO of the Space Foundation. Truly incredible. Thank you for coming on the show. I've loved it. It's my pleasure, and I'm so honored that you invited me. And I look forward to uh, learning more and, and working with you more on finding our journey together and how I can help you elevate your space and help your viewers find their, their place in the space ecosystem. Amazing.